There was a time when heroes were born on the field and history was written in the stadium. Now, some of the world's biggest competitions will be played on a computer, in a chair. This is League of Legends! League of Legends is an online, multiplayer, fantasy strategy game where players take control of champions to compete on the fields of justice. Players can choose a champion, then team up with other players to battle their way through minions, monsters, turrets, and opposing champions to destroy the enemy Nexus and win the day. What's important is 67 million people, 67 million, play this game every month. And wouldn't you know it, League of Legends is a user innovation. Oh. Yeah! League of Legends is a user innovation known as a mod. A mod, short for modification, is a reprogramming and customization of video game content by a user. Video game mods were first made possible by another major innovation, the personal computer. As personal computers became widely available, users were able to learn programming anytime they wanted, which meant they could learn how to modify existing computer programs like video games. The first mods were created in the early 80s by two high school students who modified the games Dino Eggs and Castle Wolfenstein by replacing the villains with Smurfs. As the prices of computers continued to drop, and computing speed increased, even more people gained the access and ability to mod. In the early 90s, several popular mods were developed by users of the game Wolfenstein 3D. The user-created content and tools actually extended the life of the game, so the game's developers, its software, made their next games, Doom and Quake, easily modifiable. The increasing availability of the internet further expanded the popularity of mods because modders were able to share content and form communities. Over the next few years, the modding community continued to grow exponentially as internet and computing speeds increased even more. Software companies such as Valve began hiring programmers from the Quake modding community to create game content. And modding became a legitimate career path to becoming a game developer. Valve continued to make modding their games even easier by giving users access to their game engine, Source, and creating a platform, Steam, for the distribution of games, mods, and modding tools. Today, mods have become so easy to create that nearly anyone can go on the internet and begin learning how to mod, and those who are skilled programmers have even more opportunities. Because of this, Warcraft 3 modder Steve Feek was able to take his mod and partner with Riot Games to develop one of the most popular commercially successful games in the world, League of Legends. Move up, hurry, please. I need you to heal me. All your minions have been obliterated, Savage Garden 97. <laughs> oh, no, 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 my turret, my turret. Ah! 
League of Legends makes me wonder, is innovation becoming more accessible for everyone? Now let's go meet an entrepreneur and through his story examine the fascinating forces driving the democratization of innovation. Meet Slava. Slava loves riding bikes in the city, and so does his friend. One night, the friend had his bike light stolen. Without his bike light, for safety and visibility, Luckily, he was okay, but Slava was determined to never let thieves hurt his friend or his fellow bicyclists again. That's when he decided to create a new kind of bike light that can't be stolen. Slava, you and I were business school classmates and uh, I remember vividly you used to bike all the time. Yeah, I loved it because I could leave my apartment six minutes before class started, bike in as fast as I could, and I get into class on time. But I remember one morning uh, in October, I ran downstairs, my bicycle is gone, my lock is cut, and then at that point I just had to sprint to class. So I ran into class 20 minutes late, all sweaty and frustrated. Um, and it just, I was absolutely infuriated. You know, I can relate to that. I had my bike connected to a rail, and I show up after class and the wheel is gone. Can't bike home, and uh, I laughed, but I was also frustrated, and I just left the bike there. Never took it back, and actually never biked in Cambridge again. So you just gave up on it? <laughs> just yeah. let it go. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a nuisance, but it can also be a hazard. Uh, a friend of mine actually had his bicycle light stolen from his handlebars and he still had to ride home at that night from work. Car didn't see him, smashed into him. He was okay, he didn't get too hurt, but what it helped me realize was that uh, bike theft and the theft of bike gear, it's more than just a nuisance. It can, it can be really dangerous, it's a real hazard. And what did you do? Talking to friends was where I started. It was an easy place to start. And then talking to a wider group of people who are kind of active users, uh, lead users, and finding out what they're doing around it. And what I found was that a lot of them are already cobbling together solutions for this. And you actually see it when you go outside. Start noticing this outside. Yeah, give a few examples. Yeah, you go outside, start looking at bicycles, you'll notice two, th two ingredients uh, frequently, duct tape and zip ties. So the first anti-theft bike lights were bike lights that people would just rack duct tape around it. And that's how they prevent their bike lights from being stolen. Or they'd zip tie it on. And it was just enough of a nuisance for a thief to not bother doing that. So we knew that we were onto something when the lead users were actually starting to scratch their own itch and, and kind of solve their own pain. And, and once we started talking to that, them about that, not only were they saying, yeah, this is nice to have, they were saying, is I need this, and in fact, I'm already trying to solve this myself. If you can solve this for me, I'll buy this product from you. And that was what prompted you to start Fortified. Yeah, exactly. What we realized was that nobody was standing for the urban cyclists. Nobody was making bicycles and gear that could survive in a harsh city environment and protect the urban cyclists. So that's why we started Fortified Bicycle, to protect urban cyclists and their gear. Let's take a look at Slava's solution, the Defender Bike Light. Slava and his team designed a theft-resistant bike light that locks onto the handlebars with a proprietary security screw. This screw requires a special tool to unlock, which comes with the light and is not found in hardware stores. On top of that, there are multiple versions of the screw and tool set, so one tool cannot open them all, making the Defender next to impossible to steal. Innovation can be viewed as a cost, the more costly it is for you to innovate, the less likely you are to do it. But the good news, the cost of innovation has been shrinking dramatically across many fields. And for a closer view of this reality, we're going to go back to Slava. Let's talk about the first bike lights and sure. the process of how you made them. Sure. So 
we didn't have a lot of money, um, but what we needed to do is we needed to be able to create prototypes and get feedback from customers, from lead users. So our very first prototype actually was made of wood, and we just had to test to see if it clamped onto a seat post or handlebar as well. So we made that. That cost us about 25 cents. So this is the first prototype for the bike light. Yes, that's right. And 25 it, cents. Yes. The next one we 3D printed, um, and this was our first looks like prototype. And this costs us about $25. 25 bucks for yep. this prototype. Yep, $25 and took us about 12 hours to make. Uh, the next one is when we actually start to put some uh, the guts inside of it. So this one actually, when it has batteries, is working. So this costs us about $100 worth of prototype parts and took us about two, three days. And then once we had that locked in, we made the works like, looks like prototype where um, we actually machined it out of metal. Um, and the thing with each one of these steps and iterations is that each time we pass this to a customer, we got their feedback, and we improved it the next time. And each one of these cycles took no more than two to three days. How long did it take you from the first prototype to the eventual bike line, and how much money did you spend in that process? So from this wooden prototype that I described to the final prototype we used in Kickstarter, uh, we spent about $1,500. And it took us roughly two months. This is absolutely astounding. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about two months to develop a whole new product and $1,500. That's the beauty of innovation today, the declining cost and the increasing pace of innovation. And you are a great example. Let's talk about Kickstarter. Okay. Why did you decide to launch your bike light on Kickstarter? It was kind of out of necessity. I didn't have any money. I had a bunch of student loan debt. Uh, I had $170,000 in student loan debt, and I was living with my mom at the time. And um, I needed a way to pre-fund this product. Uh, and then part of it was that any venture has risk, and by putting it on Kickstarter, I've already proven that people want the product. I have people that have pre-purchased the product, and it de-risks my venture. And I know that you're launching a new Kickstarter campaign soon. We actually have a number of Kickstarters coming up. So basically, every single product that we make, we're going to pre-fund on Kickstarter. So it's like getting a couple hundred thousand dollar investment round a couple times a year. This is really cool, Slava. The other cool thing to me is your evolution as inventor, as entrepreneur. And I want to trace it back because I think many events in your life highlight the nature of innovation today. For example, your family immigrated here from the former Soviet Union. We came as refugees from the former Soviet Union in 1980, when I was six months old. Um, and just before we left, my father lost his job, because that's what happens to uh, em emigrants of uh, the Soviet Union. So to make money, he actually opened a small business out of our apartment making golden rings. So he was a jeweler. The thing is, if he got caught, he would have been thrown into jail and we never would have left the, the country because the country that I came from, it was actually illegal to be an entrepreneur. So when we got here, the, the family's immigrant American dream was to start a business. So I think that just kind of, uh, I don't know if it came out of the womb that I wanted to start a company, but just the, the inability to do it from the country we left to the privilege of doing it here was part of what drove, uh, part of what motivated me. And here you are today, at the wheel of a pretty exciting startup. Over the course of the journey, you experienced some of the fundamental drivers of innovation today. Based on what you've seen, what is the future of innovation? I know that the most exciting products that are gonna come out are not gonna come from big companies. They're gonna come from entrepreneurs and innovators and just people who see the world not the way it is right now, but the way that it should be and the way that it will be. Inspiring message. All I can say is, Thank you for your time today. Really fantastic to spend time with you. Good luck. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> so let's ask, what enables entrepreneurs like Slava to be successful? For this and a few other questions, let's go to Eric Van Hippel. Fabulous night, huh? As good as it gets in Boston. When I see the, the red line yeah. passing by, I, I think of Goodwill Hunting. <laughs> um, but you know, earlier today we saw Slava. And what's incredible about that story is Slava discovered a problem and within a very short time his solution, his product was in the hands of users like him. And I ask, is this 
an isolated example or a representation of something larger, broader happening in society? Mm -hmm. This is very general. Innovation is getting cheaper. And he did it for something like 1500 bucks. Yeah. Forming a company and getting it funded is cheaper. And he showed us that. He's using crowdfunding. Getting market information is cheaper because it's connected to crowdfunding. People who give money to him want to buy the product. Finding teammates is easier because yeah. communication costs are yeah. dropping. Yeah. And when everything drops like this in cost, what happens is there's more of it. It's already huge. I mean, 6% of the U.S. population that's innovates as users. That's it's millions of people. There's 20 million people. And just think of all the fabulous stuff these people are doing. Yeah. Now, when a lot of them also found companies, you know, we've got ourselves a big, huge chunk of innovation ecosystem. That's a lot to be excited for. Mm -hmm. But if I put on the hat of someone, let's say, running a large company today, yeah. I am incredibly concerned. Yeah, you don't have to be. I mean, basically, companies are not necessarily having to be in the business of innovation to be successful. How so? Uh, that's, that's a pretty unusual yeah. statement to me. Yeah, well, they often now acquire their innovations they do. from individual entrepreneurs or from small companies that have sort of taken away the risk and shown the market. So what they're doing is they're getting more and more low cost, high quality potential products to build. So they're focusing on building, but the sourcing of ideas, that's left to the users. That can be left to the users and the distribution and all that stuff can be in the hands of companies. You know, um, what I like about this narrative, it's actually a friendly narrative to me. Today we hear a lot about disruption. A startup disrupting a big company, yeah. disrupting an industry, disrupting yeah. a market. But you know, this picture is more symbiotic. It's about collaboration. It's always been there, but companies have not really recognized it or organized for it. So companies often have internal R and D who feel outsiders as rivals, <laughs> when in fact they both have something to do. You know, the small companies can innovate on the new concepts. The big companies can supply all sorts of product engineering work and so forth. So there's something for both sides to do. But it'll become much more efficient when both sides recognize the symbiosis we're talking about. You know, that's a future I want to be a part of. <laughs> it's a future that's here, so it's lucky you want to be a part of it. <laughs> you don't have any choice. Well, great to see you, Eric. Good Thank to see you, you so much again. So, what have we learned here today? Innovation and diffusion are becoming more accessible for everyone. Due to the decreasing costs of technology, communication, entrepreneurship, and more, established companies sometimes contribute by enabling user innovators instead of seeing them as rivals. And if the two collaborate, with established companies producing and diffusing and users developing new products, the relationship will be beneficial for both sides. If the future is about more and more people innovating, collaborating, becoming entrepreneurs, and better ideas helping us all change the world, I want to be a part of this future. It's a lucky thing because it's here and you're in it. So, what are you waiting for?